Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading is of Chapter 7 and a reflection on the same. Chapter 7 Prince Vasily kept the promise he had given to Princess Drubitskaya, who had spoken to him on behalf of her only son Boris on the evening of Anna Pavlovna's foray. The matter was mentioned to the emperor, an exception made, and Boris is transferred into the regiment of the Semenov Guards with the rank of cornet. He received, however, no appointment to Kutuzov's staff, despite all Anna Mikhailovna's endeavors and entreaties. Soon after Anna Pavlovna's reception, Anna Mikhailovna returned to Moscow and went straight to her rich relations, the Rostovs, with whom she stayed with when she was in town, and where her darling Bori, who had only just entered a regiment of the line and was being at once transferred to the guards as a cornet, had been educated from childhood and lived for years at that time. The guards had already left Petersburg on the 10th of August, and her son, who had remained in Moscow for his equipment, was to join them on the march to Radzilov. It was St. Natalie's Day, and the name day of two of the Rostovs, the mother and the youngest daughter, both named Natalie. Ever since the morning, carriages with six horses have been coming and going continually, bringing visitors to the Countess Rostova's big house on the Povaraskaya, so well known to all Moscow. The Countess herself and her handsome eldest daughter were in the drawing room with the visitors, who came to congratulate and who constantly succeeded one another in relays. The Countess was a woman of about 45, with a thin oriental type face, evidently worn on with childbearing. She had had twelve. A languor of motion and speech, resulting from weakness, gave her a distinguished air, which inspired respect. Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drupitskaya, who as a member of the household was also seated in the drawing room, helped to receive and entertain the visitors. The young people were in one of the inner rooms, not considering it necessary to take part in receiving the, vid- the visitors. The Count met the guests and saw them off, inviting them all to dinner. I am very grateful, very grateful to you, mon cher, or mon chéri. He called everyone without exception and without the slightest variation in his tone. My dear, whether they were above or below him in rank, I thank you for myself and for our two dear ones whose name day we are keeping. But mind, you come to dinner or I shall be offended, mon chéri. On behalf of the whole family, I beg you to come, mon cher. These words he repeated to everyone, without exception or variation and with the same expression on his full, cheerful, clean-shaven face, the same firm pressure of his hand, and the same quick, repeated bows. As soon as he had seen a visitor, he returned to one of those who were still in the drawing room, drew a chair toward him or her, and jauntily spreading out his legs and putting his hands on his knees with the air of a man who enjoys life and knows how to live, he swayed to and fro with dignity, offered surmises about the weather, or touched on questions of health, sometimes in Russian, and sometimes in a very bad but self-confident French. Then again, like a man wary but unflinching in the fulfillment of duty, he rose to see some visitors off, and, stroking his scanty gray hairs over his bald patch, he asked them to dinner. Sometimes, on his way back from the anteroom, he would pass through the conservatory and pantry into the large marble dining hall, where tables were being set out for eighty people, and looking at the footmen, who were bringing in silver and china, moving tables, and unfolding damask table linen, he would call Dmitri Vasilievich, a man of good family and the manager of all his affairs. And while looking with pleasure at the enormous table, he would say, Well, Dmitri, you'll see that things are all right as they should be. That's right. The great thing is the serving. That's it. 
but with a complacent sigh, he would return to the drawing room. Maria Lavonna Karagina and her daughter, announced the Countess's gigantic footman in his bass voice, entering the drawing room. The Countess reflected a moment and took a pinch from a gold snuff box with her husband's portrait on it. Quite worn out by all these collars. However, I'll see her and no more. She is so affected. Ask her in. She said to the footman in a sad voice, as if saying, Very well, finish me off. A tall, stout, and proud looking woman, with a round face, smiling daughter, entered the drawing room, their dresses rustling. Dear Countess, what an age! She has been laid up, poor child, at the Razumovsky's ball, and Countess Aperskina. I was so delighted came the sounds of animated feminine voices interrupting one another and mingling with the rustling of dresses and the scraping of chairs. Then one of those conversations began, which last out until, at the first pause, the guests rise with the rustle of dresses and say, I am so delighted, Mama's health and Countess Aperskina, and then again rustling, pass into the anteroom, put on cloaks or mantles, and drive away. The conversation was on the chief topic of the day, the illness of the wealthy and celebrated beau of Catherine's day, Count Bazukov, and about his illegitimate son, Pierre, the one who behaved so improperly at Anna Pavlovna's reception. I am so sorry for the poor Count, said the visitor. He is in such bad health, and now this vexation about his son is enough to kill him. What is that? asked the Countess, as if she did not know what the visitor alluded to though she had already heard about the cause of Count Bazukov's distress some fifteen times. "'That's what comes of modern education,' exclaimed the visitor. "'It seems that while he was abroad, this young man was allowed to do as he liked. Now in Petersburg I hear he has been doing such terrible things that he's being expelled by the police.' "'You don't say so,' replied the countess. "'He chose his friends badly,' interposed Anna Mikhailovna. "'Prince Vasily's son, he, and a certain Dolokhov have, it is said, been up to the heaven only knows what, and they have had to suffer for it. Dolokhov has been degraded to the ranks, and Bazukov's son sent back to Moscow. Anatoly Kuragin's father managed somehow to get his son's affairs hushed up, but even he was ordered out of Petersburg. But, but what have they been up to? asked the countess. They are regular brigands, especially Dolokhov, replied the visitor. He is the son of Maria Ivanova Dolokhovna, such a worthy woman, but there, just fancy, those three got hold of a bear somewhere, put it in a carriage, set off with it to visit some actresses. The police tried to interfere, and what did the young men do? They tied a policeman and the bear back to back and put the bear into the Machia Canal. And there was the bear swimming about with the policeman on his back. What a nice figure the policeman must have cut, my dear, shouted the Count, dying with laughter. Oh, how dreadful. How can you laugh at it, Count? Yet the ladies themselves cannot help laughing. It was all they could do to rescue the poor man, continued the visitor, and to think that it is Cyril Vladimirovich's Bazukov son who amuses himself in this sensible manner. And he was said to be so well-educated and clever. This is all his foreign education has done for him. I hope that here in Moscow no one will receive him in spite of his money. They wanted to introduce him to me, but I quite declined. I have my daughters to consider. What do you say this young man is so rich? asked the countess, turning away from the girls, who at once assumed an air of inattention. His children are all illegitimate. I think Pierre also is illegitimate. The visitor made a gesture with her hand. I should think he has a score of them. Princess Anna Mikhailovna intervened in the conversation, evidently wishing to show her connections and knowledge of what went on in society. The fact of the matter is, said she significantly, and also in a half-whisper, Everyone knows Count Cyril's reputation. He has lost count of his children, but this Pierre was his favorite. How handsome the old man still was only a year ago, remarked the Countess. I have never seen a handsomer man. Well, he is very much altered now, said Anna Mikhailovna. As I was saying, Prince Vasily is next heir through his wife, but the Count is very fond of Pierre, looked after his education, and wrote to the Emperor about him. So then, in the case of his death, and he is so ill that they may die at any moment, and Dr. Lorraine has come from Petersburg, too, no one knows who will inherit this immense fortune, Pierre or Prince Vasily. Forty thousand serfs and millions of rubles. I know it all very well, for Prince Vasily told me himself. Besides, Cyril Vladimirovich is my mother's second cousin. He's also my Boris's grand godfather, she added, 
as if she attached no importance at all to that fact. Prince Vasily arrived in Moscow yesterday. I hear he has come on some inspection business, remarked the visitor. Yes, but between ourselves, said the princess, there is a pretext. The fact is, he has come to see Count Cyril um, Vladimirovich, hearing how ill he is. But do you know, my dear, that was a capital joke, said the count. And seeing that the elder visitor was not listening, he turned to the young ladies. I can just imagine what a funny figure that policeman cut. As he waved his arms to impersonate the policeman, his portly form again shook with a deep, ringing laugh. The laugh of one who always eats well, and in particular drinks well. So do come and dine with us, he said. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 7. We're going to move right into the reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 7, Name Day. Princess Anna Mikhailovna Drubitskaya, having secured her son Boris a position through her connections in Petersburg, goes to Moscow. We go with her. We go with her to the estate of one of the three great aristocratic families of the novel, the Rostovs. The Rostovs are celebrating St. Natalie's Day, the name day of two members of their home, Countess Natalia Rostova, the mother, and one of her daughters, the little Countess Natalie Ilichiena Rostova. She's known as Natasha. Name days are an important business in 19th century Russia, right up there with the celebration of birthdays. To that end, Count and Countess Rostova keep themselves busy greeting their guests as they arrive for the evening's festivities. Count Rostov is fresh, cheerful, and lively. The Countess, on the other hand, is a bit more reserved and listless. That's what giving birth to 12 children will do to you, I suppose. While their personalities may disagree, the focus of their conversation as they greet the guest is in total agreement. Everybody is talking about Pierre. It turns out Pierre has been banished from Petersburg for tying a policeman to a bear and then throwing them both into a canal thing these kids today get into, huh? Pierre's behavior naturally leads the conversation to a discussion about his sick and dying father, Count Pazukov. Count Pazukov is one of Russia's richest men. We learn that although Pierre is an illegitimate son of Count Pazukov, he is also his favorite. All things considered, being favored by one of Russia's richest men is probably a good position to find oneself in. And this is exactly what everyone wants to talk about. The ultimate fate of Count Pazukov's wealth. Will it go to Pierre? Or will it go to Count Vasily, Bazukov's next heir through his wife? As it happens, Count Vasily is in town on some unrelated inspection business. Ah, the intrigue. The gossip is terminated, however, when Count Rostov invites his guest to sit down to dinner. If, dear reader, you're reading A War of Peace along with the calendar year, then it's still, kind of, the new year. I'm sure we're all struggling with keeping our resolutions. I know I am. This year, I'll keep Pierre in mind whenever I'm tempted to stray from my resolute path. Recall from yesterday's reading how Pierre promised Prince Andrew that he would no longer hang out with Anatoly Karagin. Pierre agreed to this resolution because he understood that if he did, his chances of behaving poorly would increase. Well, Pierre broke his resolution, and now he's kicked out of Petersburg, in trouble with the law, and the subject of all manner of negative gossip. Like Pierre, we often find ourselves behaving poorly. We just as often find ourselves blaming others for our poor behavior. The truth, as Epictetus says, is that our decision to behave is entirely our own fault. This year, let's keep Epictetus and Pierre in mind as we internalize our failings, rather than externalize them. Daily Meditation If you wish to be a man of modesty and fidelity, who shall prevent you? If you wish not to be restrained or compelled, who shall compel you? compel you to desires contrary to your principles, to aversions contrary to your opinion. Epictetus, The Discourses. All right, thanks for joining me today in my reading and reflection on Chapter 7 of uh, War and Peace. Uh, remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation at PayPal. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything are below. Tomorrow we will be reading and reflecting on chapter 8 of War and Peace. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and of others.